Okay, great. So we are uh, uh, holding our annual boot camp for users and submitters. Uh, we're going to start with the users track, and um, we're going to kick off by uh, my giving a walkthrough of our recently uh, renovated uh, website and new documentation site. Um, so first, we're going to take a look at the revamped. Uh, I'm just going to let somebody else join. Welcome to the boot camp. We're just getting started. We um, uh, had a little late start. Uh, so this is our new uh, revamped uh, FaceBase homepage. And as you can see uh, at the top, uh, there is this new um, keyword search. So this is a um, free text search field that lets you search across our data sets. And we have some example uh, uh, choices, uh, but obviously you can do whatever you want, but I'll just use uh, this gene as an example. And if you uh, click search data, this will search across our repository and uh, provide um, instances of that. And as you can see, this brought up seven data sets uh, that mention this gene. You can also uh, go through our filtering uh, sidebar. If you're you know, focused on a certain species, you can uh, filter by that, et cetera. Uh, so we're really excited about this new feature. We also have a new uh, data summary section, which is a dynamic representation of uh, statistics from our website, from our repository, I should say. So over on the left here, you can see some numbers that represent the number of data sets that are major uh, organization of data by data sets. And each data set has one or more experiments. And so you can see the number of experiments represented there. Also, these links will take you directly to a search that includes all of the uh, experiment uh, records. Uh, and then we also represent uh, the number of imaging records that we have, just to kind of give you a sense of the um, uh, how much uh, data we have there. Uh, we have a big Browse All Data Sets button. I'll show you later uh, more about our navigation, which is another way to delve into that. Um, but these charts are another representation of the kind of data that we have available um, in our repository. So this first chart is number of subjects by species. And by subjects, we mean, uh, for example, for uh, human uh, data, that means the number of human subjects. And then for animal data, that represents the number of uh, biospecimens used. So that just gives you an idea of um, how many we have. You know, kind of roughly split, split um, mouse has a majority, and then uh, we have uh, many human subjects, and then uh, fewer of the uh, zebrafish and other species that we represent. But this also kind of gives you an idea of the species uh, that we uh, represent currently in our repository. We're also looking for more. Um, uh, especially Galascal, that's a new species of interest uh, for phase space. And on the right, we have number of data sets by assays. So this gives you a breakdown of the different types of uh, data of assays that we have. Um, tomography, gene expression are very major assay types. Uh, we also go down into epigenetics, uh, analysis or secondary analysis microscopy, GWAS, facial scans, and material analysis. Uh, when you go down further, we have uh, representations, info pages for the three major species that we have. So FaceBase is not only a data repository, it also has resources that have been developed by uh, our former spoke projects from our first two phases of FaceBase, and then also other contributions from our uh, data contributors. So I'll use, um, start with mouse as an example. And so um, when you go over here, you can see there's like a short cut to just browse all mouse data. If you click there, this also is another chart that represents the assay types, but just for mouse data. And as you can see, it's, you know, it's pretty diverse. Uh, and then we have the mouse data summary, which I'll uh, uh, demonstrate in a minute. Uh, then we have more uh, resources. We have a really great mouse skull fly through video um, that really breaks down the um, anatomical regions of the mouse skull in an engaging way. Uh, we have an atlas here that shows mouse anatomy by age stage and the different regions are color coded. 
And you can go down here and see um, you know, many other resources, including some links to external resources. Um, for this mouse data summary, this is a really um, interesting uh, resource that shows the data that's available by age and by anatomical region. And just to point out that the anatomical regions on the left side are um, in alphabetical order, not by region order. Um, so what you might wanna do is do like a control F on your browser page and say you're looking for mandible. This will just kind of highlight all of the related mandible regions. So if you want to look at um, just overall mandible, you know, here it is. And then you can see how it, uh, that all these different colors represent different assay types. So there's a legend at the very bottom, but it definitely gives you an idea of like per age stage, what um, uh, where there's uh, data to look at. And then if you click one of these, say you're interested in E13.5, uh, you just click here and then it will take you to a search uh, for uh, those kind of data sets and there are three available here. Okay, and then also um, moving on to, actually I'm going to kind of go and use our breadcrumbs. This is another aspect of our um, website that's new is the ability to kind of backtrack uh, using uh, breadcrumbs. So here we can go to uh, something that kind of is an overview of the resources available and I'll go into zebrafish. And uh, that's another info page. And here, I uh, just want to point out the anatomical navigation available. There's one available for mouse as well. Um, actually, I have this already up here. So this provides a mesh data set um, that color codes all the regions of the zebrafish head, of the zebrafish skull. And this allows you to kind of toggle the visibility of each region so you can have a better idea of what, what is where. Uh, this scrolls down. And um, if you go ahead and click uh, one of the anatomical regions, one of interest to you, and then scroll down, this will uh, display all of the, this only shows for me as a super user. So this shows our anatomy page, which then lists any uh, related data sets for that anatomical region. Okay, I'm just gonna go back to the home page. And when you go further down, we have our image search. So this is a definitely a new feature since our last boot camp. Um, we just use this to highlight uh, many different types of images that we have. We don't just have images as you saw in our previous charts, but we have um, micro CT, Florence microscopy. Um, and then you can, Click here to search through all of the imaging records uh, if that's uh, of interest to you, but here's just an example of um, one for enhancer activity. And you know when you go there, if there are thumbnails available, this will show up here. And again, you can uh, filter using the sidebar for um, the other attributes that you're interested in. And below that, we have typical uh, latest news and then um, listing of our late, latest publications uh, that uh, include or are based on face-based data. So um, then I just wanna kind of go through our updated navigation. So at the top, we have navigation to all of our resources. Data uh, relates specifically to our data repository. So this gives you ways to enter it. You can go through all data sets, projects, protocols, image search, uh, by species, and by modality. Um, then under resources, this uh, bubbles up all the resources that are available aside from our uh, data repository. So uh, these are the major features that were uh, included on the info page. Um, so you can navigate that way. Here we have 3D facial norms, human genomics analysis, and we have genome browser tracks available on the UCSC genome browser. Uh, we also have this uh, relatively new resource um, called Enamel Base that focuses on amelogenesis um, uh, data. 
So this is a uh, big project that um, includes a primer, a uh, listing of mouse models, and then protocols that were used. So this is an exciting new resource uh, for phase space. Uh, next up, we also have um, the contribute area. So this gives you the information that you need in order to um, uh, submit data to phase space. Uh, we go over things like overview and advantages, you know, why you should contribute your data uh, and tips on preparing your data. And um, Rob and Alejandro will be talking much more in depth about this in our second uh, contributors track. Um, next is policies, uh, data access policies, specifically describing the difference between open access data and controlled access data in phase space. And then uh, this is where you, um, get the link to our docs about how to request controlled access data and Alejandro will talk more about that soon. Uh, and then under community, we have uh, thing, our external facing events such as this one. And then also some uh, resources of interest to the community such as uh, new to face space, uh, publications, and then uh, information about our training and our annual community forum, which are, we're already working on for next year. And uh, our monthly office hours, which happen on the last Wednesday of every month. And uh, let me just uh, drill down to the new to face space page. This is uh, of interest to newbies and kind of collects uh, some good getting started information, including our what is face space video. And it also breaks it down by user types. So um, special links of interest if you're a basic scientist or a clinician researcher or a student, et cetera. And then under help, we have typical things like FAQs. We have information on citing face space and Rob is gonna go into more details about that. Uh, we have a link to our uh, video, our YouTube page, which has uh, a lot of helpful videos. Uh, but I wanna point out here towards the end is uh, our documentation site. So this is brand new, it's a separate site. So if you wanna go back to the main face space page, you can always click the logo here, but um, this provides all of our documentation uh, directed to user types. So for people who are using face space, um, here we have this exporting data from face space page, things like that, and uh, controlled access human data, submitting data. Um, there's the basics and which again will be covered later and then more advanced topics. Uh, this home page is a quick start, so that's also really good for uh, people who are just getting into face space. Depending upon uh, what you want to do, search for face space, uh, learn about contributing data, uh, how data is actually submitted. Uh, we have them in the form of docs on this site and then videos on our YouTube page. And then we also have a listing of um, the videos that we've been producing over the past few years. Um, these last two are really interesting that uh, delve into imaging data in phase space, and then omics data in phase space. And uh, just one more, the thing is that you can actually uh, do a very simple search of titles. Uh, so if you, for instance, are interested in exporting data, you can just click that and then uh, you can get to that page pretty easily. So with that, uh, that's basically our walkthrough and I can take any questions. If not, uh, hi. Um, we have somebody. Yes, hi. Um, oh, I think Navdeep has a question. Oh yeah, let me look in the chat real quick. Navdeep, okay. Oh, oh, he just wrote. Oh yeah, well, well great. Um, Hi, Navdeep, uh, craniofacial orthodontist practicing in Cambodia. Looking forward to using face space and contributing to it. That's great. Very, thank you very much. And uh, we're happy to have you. And Radhika, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm a craniofacial geneticist. I work in calvarial development in skull bone and now more recently in penisonostosis. Um, recently, I tried to navigate face space with a student and we um, got stuck a little bit. We were looking for expression patterns in the mouse embryo in certain stages, either by gene or we were looking by tissue of interest. And 
I just couldn't figure it out for the life of me. Okay. Let's see. We can take and a And I don't know if minutes. this is the place to like work it out or I, I can think, also let's see I think just because um let me just point out a couple of things and then uh we, we uh, want to have a few minutes at the end for Q&A so that we can just like get through um the program but yeah we, we definitely want to help you out so um one thing uh that you know comes to mind immediately is that we have our search on gene expression and then uh, what what in particular were you looking for? Like, what was your region of interest or? The calvaria. So I don't know what that, the calvaria is like the head region that makes the skull bones. Um, okay. So I don't so know. So I don't know if you tried any of these filters on the side. Were you aware of these when you were looking? Yeah, we got to the anatomy part. Okay, and but that wasn't that didn't pull up what you were looking for. We yeah. may not have data. I mean, if if it's not there, it may be because we actually don't have data for that particular region. But yeah, um, could be. I'll go uh, back and look again now that you're doing this. Okay. So, but yeah, let's uh, when we get to the Q and A section, um, we'll address that again. Yeah. Chris, very rapidly, if I can add, is sure. that, you know, we, we may have data for that particular uh, region or tissue. It's just that we probably have just the raw data and that raw data need to be uh, mm -hmm. analyzed to extract the gene expression patterns. So we may have the raw data, it's just that hasn't been, but that's something that we're looking into extracting. Yes. But yeah, that's that typically is... uh, at this point, mostly being left for the individual researchers to download the, you know, to acquire the specific raw data and then run your own analysis. So if I'm looking for like, say a specific gene, and if I want to look at its expression pattern. Right, then... so it may, it, may, it may be that you have to look for the tissue and see if there is a specific sequencing data for that tissue. And then in those files, you may have all that information. It's just that we don't have them tagged for specific genes because that data may contain all the genes. I see. So it's not right? like the Allen Brain Atlas where you can type in the gene and it shows you all the different places where it's expressed. Not yet, right. No, but yeah. that is, that's we something that we are working on. Okay. Um, but that's yeah, if you can hang different. out, if you can hang out, we'll, we'll see if there's um, more ways that we can help you. <clears throat> Uh, but thank you so much for bringing that up because that helps us with developing our use cases too. So that, you know, that definitely is something that we want to work on more. Okay, great. So um, just to, in the interest of time, I think we'll move on to our next segment, which is Rob, and he's going to be talking about uh, more in depth about searching for data. Okay, thanks, Chris. I just have a couple slides to share, and then we'll go back into a uh, uh, demonstration of the site. Um, okay, so Chris gave us sort of a broad overview of Face Space and a lot of the new features that are um, available in the redesign of the site since the last boot camp. Um, uh, in my section, I'm going to do more of a deep dive into uh, the search facilities so that um, we can help you know how to navigate around and find specific uh, collections of data that may be of interest to you. So the first thing is just kind of understanding the mode of search um, in face space. So, um, you know, sometimes uh, we might be more familiar with, say, a Google type of search. You could think of this also like a PubMed type of search where we're looking through a large uh, collection of primarily text documents. Um, but that's quite a different mode than if you think about um, when you're looking for something that's a physical real world object and data is kind of like that too, because it's not a, a document. It might be um, uh, you know, a, a, a sequence read or images, and those are really described by their various attributes. So you know, I kind of draw the analogy here. If you were looking for something really specific uh, in a car, just a kind of an average uh, non-science example here. Um, you know, you you would probably look for it more on a, a specialized site that that uh, has particular filters for that type of object you're looking for. 
And when you go to those, it, you know, it's more like a, an eBay or an Amazon type of experience where you're looking for um, specific, you're using specific filters. And this has the name faceted navigation. You don't really need to remember that specific term, but it's really a common mode of, of navigation through these sites. And um, when you go to those, you generally have like a set of filters running down the left-hand side. And so when you come to FaceSpace, it's much like that as well. Um, so uh, as Chris kind of showed you briefly there, uh, we do have a search interface. Um, of course, um, because our data are uh, not um, text documents, you're really searching over descriptions or abstracts and keywords. And what you really want to do is once you get into a your first level of results, you might want to start filtering down specific things like the type of experiment or species anatomy that you'll see. Now, everything that is in base space is organized according to um, a well-defined what's called data schema. This is a structure for data. So um, our objective is not only to make data standardized so that they are structured for you know, a person coming to the site, but also so that it is machine interpretable, meaning that we can actually export data that goes to a, uh, a, a data analysis pipeline and uh, it doesn't require, say, interpreting a file name to understand which two FASTQ files go together, as an example. But you would know precisely from the information that's in face space um, and that descriptive information is sometimes called the metadata and you'll know precisely from that which two files or three or five go together or which are generated from the same biosample. So just to give you a rough idea, it's good to have sort of this layout in mind. Data is organized by the individual compute, uh, um, contributing projects. A project is just a very generic term. It could be everything from uh, an individual researcher, could be a lab, could be all the way up to an entire collaboration, could be a project. Generally, these are organized around some kind of funding mechanism. So there might be a particular grant. You could have a lab that has five different projects because they've, they've had five different um, 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 funded projects, funded um, sponsored research activities. And then each project in Face Space would contribute one or more data sets. That's just a collection of that data and the descriptive information, the metadata. Each data set is generally going to have a breakdown of descriptions of the individual experiments. These might be imaging or genomic, transcriptomic, assays, et cetera. And then they will have biosamples. Of course, we don't just have mice, but uh, um, we have uh, um, multiple animal models as well as human subjects. And then from those, you have particular data that have been collected as um, the output of those experiments. Uh, we also encourage all contributors and actually require it in the more recent data over the last five or so years to have descriptive protocols also uploaded to base space. So uh, maybe the earliest data might not have some of that, but they generally will reference publications from which you can understand the protocol. Um, and um, all of our more recent data really over the past several years has protocols associated with them. So you can get an idea of both specimen preparation data processing steps, data pipelines used to generate the data. Our objective in phase space, so uh, Chris showed examples of some of the resources, or, or at least showed you the locations of some of the resources. So those are more highly curated collections of data where someone has, has gone from uh, a initially acquired data from a, you know, from a variety of experimental types or modalities, and then generated more of a what might be called more of a knowledge resource. And we have those in phase space. The collections that I'll, I'll be uh, walking you through are ones where we have taken ex you know, the output of, of various experiments, collected that, sometimes we call that the raw or acquired data, along with the initially acquired data, whether those are the actual sequences or the images that were captured. Uh, for images, those would typically, when I say raw, really we start at about the reconstructed images, not actual um, most uh, most raw <laughs> data that comes off of the, the of, of a scanner um, and then uh, we we also encourage users to or contributors to submit process data as well so in many cases we have some amount of that too um, let's see and so once you 
find a data set, what it generally looks like is that it'll have a top level description. These will include a title and uh, as I said, a freeform description. It'll tell you what project it came from. I point out here a few, a few things of particular interest Every data set will have a persistent identifiers. This is a consistent way and permanent way of identifying any data set on FaceSpace. This makes things all, all, all data in FaceSpace citable. So you can cite these consistently in publications where the data are used. Uh, citations, which I'll mention again in a moment, is a, a citation is really for the contributors. It's not for us at FaceSpace. And then this uh, shows you also the protocols that are used in as part of the production of the data for the data set. Uh, a lot of times you can get a good idea of whether the data sets of interest to you from the keywords that are assigned to it that are towards the, the bottom of the called out section here. All of those keywords, or I should say wherever possible, and this covers the vast majority of them, they come from standardized terminology. So these aren't terms that, that, that face base made up or the contributors made up or even that we attempted to standardize ourselves. These come from, from uh, NCBI uh, curated terminology uh, uh, from various projects that have, have, have made it their goal as um, say ontologist, which is um, the term used for those that are working on the controlled vocabularies and really careful naming and standardized naming of things. So wherever possible, and this, like I said, it covers the vast majority of the terms that are, that are used to tag our data sets with keywords come from standardized vocabulary. So once you get to that point, um, you know what your, you know, the general idea of what you're looking at and you can have a really well-defined description of what that term is. And so it can be identified uh, and described unambiguously. As I mentioned, all data sets are citable resources. We have a link on every data set page that's called share and cite. It gives you a, a few consistent links under the version link and live link. Most important for citing. So those, those two are more for if you wanted to share it with a colleague, send an email to someone, that's a good, a good shortened URL to use and it'll, be, uh, it'll resolve to the data set consistently. And then most importantly for citing things, we give you an example following best practices that are advocated by nature and other top publishers about how to cite the data. And for what you'll see from this, um, and I'll, I'll actually, you may not know, but the, under the data citation, the, those listed up as the authors there are not face-based staff or face-based project members. Those are the people who contributed this data set. The only place that face-based really shows up is just in the position of the publisher. We're kind of the publisher of the data. Everything else comes from the data set. And you'll notice that there is a doi.org URL there. That is a digital object identifier, just like you have on publications. So uh, this follows the recommended format and there's even a link there called BibTex or BibTech as it's pronounced. And that can be downloaded and, and, uh, and, and imported into your reference manager. So if you use EndNote or Zotero or Mendeley or something, you can import that right in and that'll give you all the details so that you can cite the data. So let's say you've downloaded and used data from FaceSpace, please remember to cite those who have contributed the data. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna switch gears here and we're gonna go through a few of these links and look at kind of a general image search as well as, or sorry, not image search, but data set search. And then we will look at some of the specific examples of, of visualization capabilities. So with that, let me pull up my browser. Okay, so again, uh, Chris kind of gave you a few highlight uh, or yeah, a few quick overviews and highlights of the site. So as I mentioned, I'll drill down more closely. So let me just give you the an idea of what are the entry points. So at the top here, we now have a search bar. Again, this searches across descriptions, maybe um, titles, descriptions, keywords that are used to label the data sets. Uh, and then there's, if you're not sure where to begin, we give a couple examples. We also have browse all data set button uh, on the left-hand side. In the navigation bar under data, there are also a few entry points. These are really just entry points into the same search environment. So you're, you're always ending up about in the same place, but with different filters automatically set for you. 
And then Chris also showed the various um, organism specific resource pages. Each of these, I'll just go to mouse and come back, but each of these also have a link into the mouse data. So um, it all leads back to the same search interface. These aren't different collections or silos or anything like that. We've been careful to make sure that all of our data collection is, is uh, uniformly recorded and so uh, and, and organized. So let me come back here and let's just say we start off with, we'll start off with a simple term here, let's say mandible. And from that search, we drop into our, our collection of data sets that have mandible somewhere in the, the, the terms, the keywords, the description. So I get my first set of results here. I can see some additional um, information about it, like the experiment type. I can quickly see that I have RNA-seq data here, uh, micro CT, and, and so on down the experiment type column. I can see which species, because again, base space has data on multiple species, the age stages, and so on. On the left-hand side, we have the filters. So one thing that's important to note is that the, just wanted to show you how these filters work, that there's nothing sequential about them. You don't have to follow them in order. You can just scroll down and see which ones might be of interest to you. You may know that you're looking for zebra fish. So you could set the filter for a zebra fish by checking off the box uh, and, and see that we just have one data set matching that particular filter. We probably have a lot. It's, it's also good to know that we probably have a lot of data or may have a lot more data on a particular uh, anatomical region, um, but it, it, it could be labeled as skull because a lot of our images are whole, whole head images. In some cases, they're, they're whole organism uh, images. And so you might broaden your search if you're looking for, say, images that might be covering a broad region. They won't necessarily be labeled with every term that's within skull or within, um, you know, mandible, et cetera. So following that example, let's say we scroll down here, any of these little labels can be clicked on and expanded. So I can expand the gene label, uh, the age stage. And again, nothing sequential about these. I don't have to go in order. I can look at anatomy. So I could also see here that we have several, several more terms that are available within this. Um, what this means is these are any potential terms that are labeled on the data set. So they may or may not be related to when I typed in mandible at the top, that's just narrowing the search space, but I might be able to find other things that are unrelated to mandible because they're contained within the same data set. A data set could be arbitrarily broad, but it's usually focused on one specific study related to one publication. Okay, so I could, for instance, pick out first arch mandibular component and, and refine my search and find one specific data set that had that. I'm going to relax that by unchecking it. The next thing to note is that you'll see here that we have a listing and then a little link called show more. We also have a, a search all columns here within each little search box so you can filter these down. So what I wanna show you is that with show more, there might be many more terms that are available. So let's say I'm looking for a particular gene of interest. I say show more. So this gives you quite a bit more detail when you're trying to filter by a gene. So this is searching by gene up here. Now let's say I had a, a gene of interest in mind and I'm gonna pick this one that I know exists. Let's say we have COLA1. I look for Rob, kind of interesting. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just letting you know, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, so the interesting thing to note here is that this is not actually the official NCBI gene name. It's actually col one a one, but we search over all of the possible synonyms. So we have a rich set of records from the NCBI gene terminology set. And I was able to find my gene based on that synonym. So if I check the box, click submit, now I've filtered down this set to just one data set that matched both my original search term mandible and the COLA1 gene. So let's go ahead and open up this data set and see what we find here. So as I mentioned before, 
data set records start off with descriptive information at the top. We have the title and description. We have a list of identifiers in this first column. You see the digital object identifier. We see who contributed the data set, uh, the list of protocols, keywords, and then we can keep scrolling down and we get into detailed information on the experiments. Further down, we get to the biological samples, the, the various uh, the, the characteristics of the specimens used in the experiments, and then we have imaging data. And again, we see it says displaying first 25 records. So there's a lot more than what might appear on a given page. It'll also tell you displaying all uh, of a certain number if, if it was, um, so in this case, displaying all five records. So you see that this is the complete set. So let me go ahead and drill down into one particular experiment. So as I said, remember that with that diagram, we have, we have information uh, structured according to the experiment, the biosamples involved. So as I look down, I can find images here. Uh, let's say I'm interested in taking a closer look at this first one. So this pulls up a, a high resolution image. It's as it, we can handle really arbitrarily high resolution images, and it's really what was contributed. And you can pan and scan and zoom online. So this is one example of the visualization capability in face space. Now, as I mentioned, I'm just going to pop back to the data set itself and just show you a couple more things. You can actually export the in, entire collection of data in a format called BD Bag, and we once you download this, we have a desktop client that can download all the, the data for that, that collection. So this downloads pretty quickly with all the metadata and the links to all the files. Um, and then outside the scope of this demo, you can also download all of the, um, all of the, the, um, the, the large data files. And then share and cite link gives you the, the citation information, gives you the example of how to cite this data, and then the downloadable BibTeX record. So lastly, I just want to give you an example of what other data sets might have. Let's see, I have a few examples queued up here of the other types of visualizations. Let me just find where I have that set up here. Okay, so another high resolution image here, we have, um, we have annotations on it. So we do have an annotation capability where some images may be labeled by the contributor. Next up, we some data sets. I'll just show you. This is a data set like any other here at the top. Um, we have um, what are called surface surface meshes. So if you have, say, volume images that have been um, uh, converted into a surface mesh, we have we are able to show those online. So this is like a comparison between a control and a mutant sample here. Another in another data set that was sequencing data. Just showing you again that it's just a, a normal data set. It has a uh, the, the genome annotation track files that are being rendered actually by the UCSC genome browser. And we operate a track hub and then put these on our site, um, uh, making the genome browser visible from our site. Next up, we have a, a data set here that has some single cell data. And I'll just go to one that I have opened up. So we have the UCSC cell browser, and we actually have a pipeline that generates this data. You can view it in a Surat UMAP layout, switch to a Surat DCA layout. And let's just see if I have one more working here. Oh, sorry, I think this, this one, here we go. Um, so I had this one queued up because these are a little larger to download, but somehow went away in the background. So we also have uh, images that are uh, a way of viewing our volume images online. So you can rotate around and move through the slices of the image along all three orthogonal axes. You can actually, this is gonna take a little while. So I'm about out of time, but I actually don't miss this little slide out on the upper left-hand side because this allows you to render the uh, the render it in kind of a pseudo three D model. So there we go, and it does a little. It'll do a processing a couple times, and uh, uh, but any of the images that you see in this form can also be 
switched into a 3D mode. And with that, I am uh, done here. I just wanna point out one last thing. Again, we have citing face space in the help. This will give you the information. Again, it's not so much citing face space. If you found, if there was something, a uh, resource on face space that are of use, you can cite face space, but most importantly, we really want you to know, cite specific data sets from face space. So we give you those examples. There are links at the bottom if you wanna learn more about citing data, such as the nature research. So this is their guidelines. They give examples of how you would put statements in your data availability statement and so on. And with that, I am um, I, I'm done yeah. with my section here. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Rob. Okay, next up is Alejandro Bugakov, and he is going to talk to us about uh, how to request controlled access data. Okay. Hello. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see my screen. Yep. Okay, hello. Hello. So, um, my name is Alejandro Bugakov. I work as a data scientist here at the Facebook Hub, also with uh, Rob and Christina and Laura and the rest uh, at ISI. Uh, I just want to talk, Think. I mean, first I want to thank uh, Rob and Chris for showing everything, even the introduction to the site. I want to talk about something about um, human subject data and how to request human subject data. Uh, a, a lot of what um, Chris um, Rosh has showed uh, doesn't really quite apply to human subject data, unfortunately, you know, because of the nature of being uh, control access, we need to protect that data in a way that we cannot really uh, show or make it directly accessible to the user on, a, on the browser. But we do have those uh, a very large collection of data sets. So, so I want to talk about why requesting human data. So we we not only have a, a lot of uh, human subject data set, but we have uh, data that is very diverse in terms of uh, you know type of population, different type of syndromes, and different type of data. You know we have like for example just to give us a few examples, we have a, a very large collection of about 4,000 facial scans from a Tanzania population. I think that's a very unique type of data. Same thing about uh, North American children. Uh, we have uh, studies that, for example, focus with a very large number of scans for a, a specific syndrome. We have RNA sequencing. We have a, we have a, you know a study of oral health, in Northern Appalachian. You know we have some very unique studies about very very, very specific type of disease on children. Anyway, so I want to mention that because sometimes people don't know and it's not extremely clear that we have all the data, but um, I wanna mention that. But uh, because that data is controlled, uh, you know, we cannot make it available for publicly download, like uh, what, what Rob showed that, you know, in all our, all our kind of model, um, mouse or zebrafish data, you basically go to a data set, you click on a file, you download it directly to the computer. Unfortunately, for this uh, human data, we cannot do that. And the way we can uh, give users access to this data is why the process that we call the data access request or the DAR. So I, I, I want to show a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about how, how this process would work. So it basically is kind of like a three-step process. So, so first you sort of gather all your institutional doc documentation, then you go to our site and you complete this form that I'm going to show later It's called the data access request. So that's basically the step number one. Then you submit that data access request that goes to uh, the NIDCR data access committee that reviews your submission. This is pretty much the same process that anyone has to go through when requesting data from DBGAP, for example. And then once it is approved, you know, this may, there might be some uh, 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 looping back from two to one to add some information, but once that the data access request is approved, then we are told that that, that's been approved and we basically contact the user and download and the user can download the data to their machine 
and once the data, once the user has the data in, in their possession, they have to stick to their rules that they have uh, uh, under contract and that data is valid for a year. So that's uh, pretty much the process. And so let me just, um, so basically the, I'm going to show now in our site uh, how this is done, but basically what you do is you first complete the document that is called the Data Use Certificate Agreement that requires some uh, institutional signature from people in your institution, like the uh, IT director, then the, the PI has to sign it, and then the signing official from the institution has to sign that document too. Then you log in to our uh, site, you create this form, you fill in all these form fields, 14 fields in our form, then you select the list of data sets, you upload the public key so that we can use that key to deliver you the data, and then you're basically done. So let me um, go back to the site and very rapidly show you what I'm trying to say. So I will go to Facebase. This is the starting point, our landing page. And then the place to go, the place where you will go in order to create a data access request is under policies. And then you go requesting control access data. Maybe I will make my screen a little larger. It's quite easier to read. And then you will hear basically in this page, we have all the steps, uh, you know, detail. Everything I'm going to talk about is explained in very good detail. But basically, uh, here in data access request page, this is where you will go and create your data access request form. So when you go in there, you basically see only three data access requests that are already in our system and has been approved. So those are, those are public and we can show them to you. There are many other that you don't see them because there's people are still working on them and there hasn't been approved yet, so you don't see them. But in order for you to log in one, you need to first sign up as a face-based user following this sign up flow. And then once you get added to the list of a face-based user, you go to login. You, I will use one of the users that I use for this. So, once you log in with that user that you just created, if you don't have one, then you just go to create. And this is the form basically with all the 14 fields that you had to fill in in order to create the data access request. So the first and one Alejandro, is- Alejandro, could you yes. make this page a bit bigger as well? Sure. Is that, is that good enough? Yeah, I think that's better, thank you. Okay, so the first, uh, the first field is the title, so test dar, but basically it's the title of your thing. Then you will uh, go through the select your principal investigator, so which is basically the person uh, um, requesting the, I will put myself as that. If you are uh, not the PI, basically, if you have a supervisor, then you can select here who's your mentor or supervisor. Uh, then this, uh, the next fields, all the fields with the red star are required. Basically, this is a research use statement. You know how, what's uh, the object of your, the aims of your, um, why you want this data, to request the data. Uh, you know, my aims are blah, blah, blah. This is a sort of a non-technical description. Description. You know, I'm sure just then some explanation on how is the data being uh, consistent with the limitations. Uh, here you will talk about how you will uh, make sure that your data is secure in the environment that you will download it to. Uh, the, there's some information in our site about what are the requirements, but basically, uh, you know, you, here you have to describe your environment. 
and then uh, if you have collaborators you can list them if not you can say there's no collaborators if you have uh, some collaborators outside your institution then you can list them here and then here it asks you if you have an IRB let's say yes for example then it will ask you the IRB protocol the expiration date I will just enter all values um, that are probably not necessarily valid but um, that will give you serve as an example so I will enter the the, the next field is the FWA number and then here it asks you for you to submit uh, your documentation so here the first one is the approval letter let's say I will uh, just upload some um, fake documents just to see how it works you will again click here select file and you select the file from your computer then here you will uh, upload the signed data use certification agreement that form is in our days our website you can download it to your machine you just need to take it to these officials to sign it and then you make a copy and you upload it here and basically and once you're done yes can you hear me oh just yeah just to let you know you have a, actually about four minutes left yeah so i'm almost done so once you've done, once you got to this point, right, you basically uh, can um, leave the status as in progress, okay, and click save, and this will create the 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 basically the initial DAR, and then what you have to do is. Uh, print this page fill in all these fields that have the that require signatures like down below here you see there are the principal investigator signature the someone from the institution that needs to sign it and once you make a copy of this and you sign it you make a, you scan it and then you have to go back here to the form upload the file here where it says upload the sign copy of the data access and then you can switch the status to complete and then you are basically done and that's going to go to the to the um, to the NIDCR uh, data access committee for reviewing now there's one more thing that you need to do before you do that which is to add which are the data sets that you are requesting so once you finish editing that form, you go here to the section that says requested data sets and you click select records. It's probably easier. So this is the list of all data sets. Uh, it's easier to show, click here which says show filter panel and then use the facets that, that uh, Rob was playing about. And that we have one of our facets is about whether the data set is protected human subject or not. So if you Select there, yes. That will just show you all the human subject data sets that we have. You can continue searching or narrowing your search by anatomy, stage, gene, whatever. Or you can just look at it, at, you know, if you already know what you want. Let's say, for example, I'm interested in facial scans. Then I can narrow the search to the uh, facial scans and select some of the facial scans uh, data sets that I like. Click link. And then this tells the doc, the data access committee that these are the data sets that you are requesting access to. And also it shows the, the DULs, which is the data use limitations, and to, to make sure that your IRB, because that this tells you whether it requires an IRB or not. And then the last thing you need, the last, last step will be to enter or upload to our site your public encryption key so that once the process uh, once your request gets approved we prepare the data we encrypt it with this data that with this key that you provide us and then we make that uh, data available for download in encrypted form so only you can 
and encrypt that files, those files and that data. So I can go here, click select file, and I will upload a fake uh, key. And that will basically be a complete data access request. So I have the encryption key, the requested data sets, and the DAR information. So if you have any questions, um, and again, you know, you can uh, contact us at any moment, any time. If you are interested in, in, in requesting data, uh, human subject data, and you have a question about any of these fields or how to uh, fill in this uh, uh, data access request, please don't hesitate to email us at help at facebase.org and we'll uh, immediately um, try to answer your questions. Great. And okay. uh, in fact, we have our uh, overall Q&A open and, you know, we were running a little late, but uh, we can go on until uh, 20 past the hour and it's eight past the hour. So please um, give us your questions. If there are no questions um, that you can think about the top of your head right now, um, is there, has this information uh, been helpful? Is this uh, information that, uh, is there any confusion about um, any of the things we've been talking about so far? Okay. Now, Deep, are these data sets available to international researchers, non-NIH researchers? So are you talking about, um, so as aside from the controlled access human data, uh, the rest of the data is, is open to whoever and, and anybody around the world can download it. Uh, for controlled access data, um, there are international researchers are able to, but um, there is there are specific uh, steps that they have to take. So Alejandro, could you expand on that more? I, 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 yes, I mean, we, we had several uh, requests from Europe and different parts of the world. And so, yes, I think that you had to submit your documentation. And once the, you know, the, the, our data access committee goes through them, the, the, the data is definitely available from non-NIH researchers. There is, um, on the documentation, there is a section that says if you are um, an international entity, uh, there is a list of approved uh, foreign institutions um, from NIH, and so it lets you uh, kind of see if your institution is listed there. Um, that helps. Um, and then uh, if not, there is an email uh, to contact uh, the DAC if you have any uh, questions, which is available on our documentation. But let me pull it up real quick. Yeah, the only real difference is that your uh, ethics board needs to be registered with the U.S. National Institutes of Health, and they give you what's called an FWA number. So just check with your ethics board. There's, I don't think there's really any other difference besides that. So um, you just need a board that is recognized by NIH, and they probably know what that is. Um, but we have links to find out more on our site if you know, if you're not familiar or if uh, your institute isn't already a member of that. But otherwise, you know, we welcome uh, uh, um, users from all over the world and anyone can access the data as long as it's for research purposes, basically. Okay, and Laura added um, the uh, search that, that I talked about earlier. Thanks, Laura. I should just clarify. I mean, generally, research purposes is the requirement, but each data set will have its own, uh, what are called data use limitations, which you can check whether it's available for other other purposes, but that's generally a limitation. Okay, and Clifford Beal asks, is all human data controlled access? If not, what would determine the status? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, no, not all human data is con considered control access. We have a lot of uh, human data that is actually public. 
So basically everything that is not uh, at the individual level or that can be, uh, lead to identify an individual uh, can be made public. So for example, from sequencing, we have some of the uh, files that for example, uh, like the, the, the BW tracks that we, I, I think, cannot be used to identify a, an individual so they don't have any kind of individual level data. Those are made public. And then, yeah, so it, it depends on the, on, on the type of data. So I should also say, we don't really make that decision. That depends on, you know, what your institute, what the institutional IRB from people who collected the data has just, I've decided about how data is going to be shared. Correct. Yeah. And I added a link to our data policies page, which gives a little more information about the difference uh, between open and controlled access. Oh, and another kind of open human data we have is um, aggregated data, uh, like, for example, the facial awareness database. Okay, so are there any other questions? We um, feel free to put them in the chat uh, or just uh, unmute yourself and ask. Okay, um, I just want to share this slide really quickly, which is, uh, you know, this is uh, the end of our first track. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us. And we'll be starting our second track with a focus on contributors um, at the half hour mark. But um, I just wanted to point out uh, that our, uh, you can always reach us at help at facebase.org. And that's not only for questions, that's also for comments or uh, suggestions or any feedback, uh, especially with the uh, updated website and the documentation site. Um, if you notice any issues or you have some suggestions for improvement, we would always uh, enjoy uh, hearing from you. And um, with that, if there aren't any other questions, uh, we're gonna take a quick break. Um, and then uh, we'll be back at the half hour mark and we'll be starting our contributors session at that point.